Hello everyone, my name is Jim Bendel and I'm hosting you for this Deep Adaptation Q&A uh, with Scott Williams today. Um, and uh, it's really, I'm really pleased that Scott's uh, joining us because he is a scientist really, really in looking at um, hazards, risks and so on at a, at a really deep level, at a cutting edge level with the UN system. Um, he's a consultant and has worked for over a decade now with uh, the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Agency on what became the UN DRR uh, and working as a contributing lead author to the report that they do, which summarizes the state of knowledge on uh, risks to humanity and um, what to do about them. So he's, um, he's joining us from Switzerland where he's lived for eight years. Scott, thank you for joining. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, yeah, great to see what we're 16, 17 people now. Hello, wherever you are in the world. So um, first up, um, it's a bit like an alphabet soup, the UN system. And although I worked with the UN as a consultant for over 10 years, uh, there's always a new acronym. So I was wondering if you could also just help people understand what is the UNDRR. Um, why does it exist? What does it exist to do? Yes, uh, alphabet soup is in alphabet jungle. Um, it's it's a bit of a mess, and and actually, this agency is probably more of a mess than than many of the others because uh, it was actually established um, in the end of the nineteen nineties, uh, at the end of what was called the International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction, um, which was a good idea back at the end of the 80s after a, a series of large-scale catastrophic disasters that happened in in many parts of the world. Um, initially it was set up as, as something called UNISDR because the uh, the world's governments agreed the, on this idea of an international strategy for disaster reduction. Maybe it'd be a good idea if we had a strategy. We weren't so ad hoc about the way we were approaching the challenges of an increasing profile of risk around the world. Um, and so it was called UN ISDR, even though it was set up as the UN Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. This is all a bit tedious and boring, yes, but it, 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 it's actually created um, uh, challenges in terms of people understanding how does the UN manage risk? Is there an office that deals with this or is it throughout everything? Because all of the different parts of the UN, whether it's the Food and Agricultural Office, FAO, or World Food Program, doesn't matter, they all have, they're obviously all managing different types of risks. But this is a specific body, which um, is, uh, is a secretariat body, which has the specific responsibility to um, report back to um, countries of the world and to, to everybody, all, all humans, um, on the general state of, of risk or the, the understanding, what's called the global assessment of risk. Um, but it's also the agency which is responsible for um, being the custodian, as they call it, the person, the, the person, the organization that has to uh, manage the way the world is implementing the intergovernmental agreements. Um, these big agreements that happen every five or 10 or 15 years. Um, and the first of these was called the Hyogo Framework back in 2005. Um, before that, there were a number of countries that were taking, starting to take, take risks seriously, but actually um, uh, after uh, the signing of the Hyogo framework, we had about 160, 870 countries who had signed on and said, we're going to do something about risk. Why is that? Because the Boxing Day tsunami, the 26th uh, uh, December 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean, which, which killed more than 300,000 people uh, and, and literally caused ripple effects across the planet, um, got people's attention, as, as often happens. Big event, all of a sudden politicians, are, oh, what are we going to do about this? Investors, what are we going to do about this? Businesses, oh, this is having an impact. And it got raised uh, up the, the profile. The profile of risk um, at that time still considered natural disaster risk was elevated quite significantly for a short period of time. Um, unfortunately, the focus at that time was still around natural disasters. It was still around these sort of acts of God, these cyclones would, would come in and level cities, these earthquakes that would impact cities. Oh, how, how terrible. And yes, they are terrible. 
Dialing forward to 2015, after the first 10 years of this intergovernmental agreement, and it was only a 10 year agreement, um, something called the Sendai framework was then agreed, which is a 15 year agreement, which sort of lines up with what some people on this call may know about the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals to be this sort of somewhat integrated approach to how we move forward with something which was called risk-informed sustainable development. So that's how we get to now having the UN Office of Disaster Risk Reduction in, in 2022 uh, about to launch whatever it is, the fifth or the sixth version of, of this report, this big fat report, global assessment report, that's the 2015, uh, 2019 version. They do it every two or three years, um, that's, and then we're going to move scary. forward. That looks that looks like a disaster in itself. That long? Oh, it's a wonderful <laughs> read. Oh, who hasn't read this? This is Harry Potter. Forget that. This is gold. No, um, I don't think anyone in the world's read this whole thing. <laughs> um, uh, have you? Have you? <laughs> uh, no, you I, wrote it. I mean, you must yeah, 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 yes, I have. <laughs> For better or worse, um, and gone to sleep with it many a night. Um, but during that period, actually, there has been there has been a shift in terms of an understanding that what people were doing in terms of what I would call thingifying risk, modeling risk. And every time you try and model risk within a complex living system, you necessarily cut out lots of stuff to be able to come up with a number. Uh, the, the, the one in 200 year probability of a flood in Vienna or whatever it might be. Um, but but that is um, necessarily reducing lots and lots of complexity, which is constantly and dynamically shifting. And so there has been a, a shift, which I've been part of over the last decade with a number of people trying to bring in this notion that risk is not a thing. It's, it's part of a process. It, it, let's think of it more in, a, in the context of a verb, that actually what we do as humans, how we choose to build things, what we choose to study, what we choose to model, how we choose to invest in things, how we choose to make policy, actually they are the drivers that actually then impact on natural processes, atmospheric processes, oceanic processes, even tectonic processes, which then create more hazards. But it's us creating the vulnerability by choosing to live in silly places and to live in those places in silly ways very few places in the world have actually come to terms with and built and created their societies in a way which is compatible in any way with the sorts of risks which they're exposed to. And so there has been a move towards, okay, can we get away from just trying to model things and have these perfect answers, which were never perfect answers, but people believed in them because they wanted the certainty, to actually, can we be in sort of a mutual, uh, non-knowing, uncertain space where we can bring many different perspectives, not just the, the science-y perspectives, the more mathematical perspectives, the Newtonian physics perspectives, but actually some of the more the indigenous ways of knowing, the relational ways of knowing, and being more in an understanding of the unknowableness of the dynamic nature of living, living systems. And can we think about how we can bring them together to have a better understanding not an understanding, but a better understanding, and that's the work that I'm 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 doing with the UN at the moment. So I'm I'm aware of, for example, the limitations of scientific method in the climate field for how then climatologists can conclude about the hazard and the risk and the timing, and then we're beginning to see some climatologists talk about cascading effects as well so that that how all manner of different tipping points might cascade into each other and beginning to really recognize also how talking about uncertainty in the modeling doesn't mean oh it's uncertain and therefore chill out everyone um, so it sounds like that's the same in a much broader range of risk areas than climate so we're talking like food we're talking like or, or, or could you just give us a, an example of, of g give us one tangible example away from climate where what you're talking about um, really matters? Um, maybe food, maybe something. I, I think you, I think you're touching on a on a pretty important point actually, which is this um, absurd compartmentalization and separation of uh, of realities which are not. 
which are interdependent in every possible sense of the word. Um, the climate folks not talking to the disaster risk folks, not talking to the sustainable development folks, not talking to the water folks, not talking to the equality. And unfortunately, the SDGs have actually enshrined and doubled down on that separation. 17 pretty boxes. SDG one, that's what I do. I do SDG seven. Oh, I'm a climate person. I'm a risk person. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, we're, we're human beings, but we're humans as part of life. And this ability, which has really developed since, you know, the enlightenment period, but actually goes all the way back to Plato's understanding of the separation of, of mind and, and body, um, that we can categorize things and say, we can understand this in this way and this in this way and pretend that underneath that, and what I call that is that's managing the trees. So it's, it's trying to manage the trees, make sure that the trees are okay without actually nourishing the soils, without actually understanding that underneath the trees, underneath the manifestations of climate risk or the manifestations of uh, the reduction in soil productivity in a food system context, or the issues with uh, global supply chain disruptions as a result of X number of things, that actually underneath that is, is a set of system conditions which give rise to a heightened probability and possibility of all of these things manifesting themselves. But actually underneath that is a, is a layer which is even more important, I think, which is at the level of the metaphors that we use and the habits that are then habituated in the way that we then think about and are even able to perceive the interdependencies of all of these different aspects that you're talking about. And when I'm talking about the metaphors, it's mm -hmm. the metaphor of, of being able to solve and fix and control and dominate, that mm -hmm. nature is some sort of a machine, as opposed to a mycelial, more ecological approach to understanding that you can't fix, you can't fix a forest. You can fix trees, you can plant trees, but you can't actually fix a forest. All you can do is nourish into it. And that notion of uncertainty is taking on board that there are aspects of all of those connections that you are part of that you can never fully understand and being humble enough and holding that confusion to say, but actually with enough perspectives from enough different places in conversation, learning together, you can actually get a better understanding. And I think there's a fear that that better understanding mm -hmm. would lead us in the direction of, oh, serious embarrassment mm -hmm. and cringe factor that, oh, we might have set things up a little wrong. This whole economic system thing, this whole living so, in very concentrated urban spaces. Maybe I'm wondering, that's creating the risk. I'm wondering, as I listen to you, how many people within the disaster risk reduction field, let alone within the UN Disaster Risk Reduction Agency, think that what we need to do is understand about the entirety of the way that we are, the way we relate to each other and nature and the, the, um, the risk that we create through just the ways we're choosing to live and the systems we're choosing to build. How many people think like that? Or how many people are just looking at that massive report that you've done and think, great, I now know how to better dominate the planet to re reduce risk. I mean, how unusual is your more holistic integrated way of thinking about this? I, well, when I started on this journey, I had hair. So um, that probably gives you an indication of how challenging this decade has been. <laughs> um, there's probably other factors at play as well, but no, um, there's not many people. Um, there's, there's very few, not that there's very few who actually hold these, um, this broader, more holistic understanding. A, a transcontextual understanding, a multi-perspective, a multi-epistemic perspective. There's many, well, many people. I'm really interested in how you got to that point, but I'm going to just park that for a moment, because therefore, knowing what you know from the best in the mainstream forms of modelling and all the different areas you've mentioned, and also knowing the limits that that has for revealing the reality of where we're at, mm. How bad is it for us right now? How bad? Um, it's, it, I think it's, it's worse than really anybody I've ever met can imagine, I would say. 
Um, I think you, the perspective that I bring in and in, in saying that there's lots of people who understand, have, have a broader understanding and Indigenous knowledge keepers that I work with in particular, have a very good understanding of the holistic and relational way of being uh, with all life. But in the UN spaces, in the intergovernmental spaces, in the investment spaces, and I you know, worked in corporates and investment space for over 20 years, um, this, this metaphor at the, at the very fundamental level of, of, of your existence, your being on this planet, is, is shifted at such an early age, about the age of four or five, when you go into the conventional educational system. And I'm not against education. What I am saying is there is a process in that educational system which forces you to categorize things and get assessed on how you know those categories and different parts of those categories. That then is then doubled down on in terms of the financial remuneration you get at being better than other people and being able to categorize and compartmentalize and be able to know those categories and compartmentalizing better than other people. That is where the power in the system sits at the moment, not in those who are displaying their full humanity, their deep complexity of understanding that they don't understand anywhere near what they thought they understood yesterday, last year, the day before. Um, releasing oneself from the notion of being an expert, of being someone who knows what's going on. If you do that, it does lead to an existential crisis. I've been through that process. It, it led me into institutionalization briefly and, uh, and you know, mental breakdown territory and requiring a lot of care and, and support to be rebuilt. Many people don't want to go through that. They glimpse it, what we're talking about, because you can't not. If you're in Istanbul last week and it snowed 60 centimeters and the whole city is like, hmm, let me think, let me talk to my grandfather and see if this has ever happened. Of course, it has never happened. <laughs> These things that people are experiencing and observing, but being able to hold that dissonance pays well. Being able to hold the integrity of the observations and your behaviors does not and is not rewarded. And it is seen as antagonistic and uh, not welcome in many spaces. Um, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be there. And it's what I try to desperately do. And it is heartbreaking most days of my work within the UN system. Having said that, there is a lot of really good human beings, you know, beautiful human beings who have been habitualized into a way of understanding and, and, and being told, this is how we fix things. We get money, we form a project, we shove it on a community. Hey, presto, they're happy. No, <laughs> we'll just want a proper conversation with them. Did we understand the relationships? Mm. No, we didn't. I just want to un understand a bit more about what you're touching on there. But I'm sorry for the, I've um, just got a building site that started a few hours ago next door. Um, you, you, I think what you're saying is that your knowledge of risk of all kinds, basically arising from the way that we live, when I say we, well, modern societies live on this planet, um, is that we, we're destroying so much right now and we've got so much shit coming towards us very soon. And it's incredibly troubling to witness that and understand it, but it's also incredibly difficult when that also then sort of almost is issues a judgment on the way one has learned to be in this world and make sense of it and progress as well, to be successful and end up having a, a good career and, and, and uh, doing the kind of work you do. Um, and then also this awful kind of, it's, it's a weird loneliness of like, can't you see everyone? <laughs> like, wake up. <laughs> so is, is, it, is it those things together which, which crushed you somewhat and also you value? Because it sounds like it's massively transformative. It sounds like you were identifying that process as how you ended up arriving at your sort of more holistic worldview now. Is that what I've heard you say, or is there so, is something else that? Uh... I, the, I think that the, the tonality of what you said, absolutely. Um, I can't remember all of what you said. It was beautiful, Jim, but um, yeah, I, I certainly, you know, 10 years ago, I was in the shouty, listen to me. I know that this is all wrong. I'm judging you 
give me a keynote speech, get me up on a platform, let me lead a team. I'm, I'm going to take us in the right direction. Um, and I, I did genuinely, I think at the time, feel that I was perceiving and seeing things from the perspective of being within, deep within that system that, as I call it, the sociopathic uh, systemic arbitrage system um, that is designed, as you said, it's an economic system which is designed to destroy life. That is what it is designed to do. If you can objectify and commoditize life, you can get people to pay for it. You can make money. You can be powerful in our system. It is de deliberately designed to, and I could see that. But the context in which I lived and the abductive process that I was actually able to live, I was still surrounded by walls of, of offices and surrounded by people who were very, very sure and certain of themselves, which helped me to feel comfortable being sure and certain of myself. In the last few years, I've spent more of my time, as much of my time as possible, every day at least, in a forest environment, in, a, in the mountains. I'm lucky enough to be in Switzerland, to have access to these infinitely complex, but also infinitely generous spaces. And generous in terms of a spiritual sense, uh, a psychological sense, a physical, in all ways. And so instead of being that shouty guy who's, you know, up on the platform going, look at me, look at me, I've got all the answers, just give me some money, I'll fix the world, which certainly was the way that when I look back going, oh, that cringe, I didn't, I didn't know any better. I'd been schooled that that is the way that you can change the world, you know, lead from the front and all of that. As opposed to now recognizing that my context have shifted so much that I am more in relationship with the, the, the generosity and that sense of reciprocity which exists in natural wild spaces. That I can, it has changed me, embodied within me to then be able to carry that into spaces and hold this sense of stochastic generosity is what I call it for want of a better word. Just being, trying to be kind and generous at all times, even when people are being abusive, even when people are being destructive and judgmental, just playing into those spaces with a sense of, uh, I love and care for you, and I accept your love and care. I do bring all of this experience and knowledge, which may be useful in our conversation, but at a human to human level, can we just get beneath our egos, beneath all those constructs, and talk about where we feel vulnerable? where we feel scared and and what we not not me and me but what we can do about this and helping people to try to find their way into a space where it's okay not to know just to be you're on mute jim i think sorry i'm, I'm fascinated there in in how you've talked about um immersion in nature by choice with mountain running i believe and mm -hmm. and how that helps somehow do something to you you talk about it being spiritually nourishing in a way that affects then how you show up at work in the very same context or even worse <laughs> you know than, than a decade ago um and that i'm wondering is it is there a flavor of of, of surrender and of cherishing like it's it's not okay you're all objects of my agency shut up and listen it's now wow we're in such a mess and i don't know quite how we're what we're going to do and how make sense of this and do something good so hi i'm scott who are you let's like let, let's try as you say drop the egos and, and start from there is that is that um is that what i've heard and my next question is are other people in your line of work getting to that point of some sense of surrender and cherishing being alive and just cherishing being able to try? I, yeah. Um, I hold this word spaciousness pretty, pretty closely um, to me, you know. It, it, why did I come up with spaciousness as a word that that sort of resonates with me? I think because of this sense of the enclosure. You know, there was obviously in your your British by background. I, I think were born at least in or 
live some of your life there. I mean, the, the enclosures of land that happened during the sort of, you know, 15th, 16th centuries and beyond were part of the enclosure and the, the, se the that separation. But there was also the enclosure of cognition and the enclosure of, of imagination even. And I think what time in wild spaces has helped me to re, re be in is, is this sense of spaciousness, which allows for that curiosity within that spaciousness that everybody is able to be in relationship in a way which is which is can be more, it can be more playful um i believe that this is really important i believe that, excellent let's let's play with that instead of i believe this is really important therefore this is right i believe this is this is definitely right and to move away from that sort of very clear clarity and, po and polarizing language, which is so tormenting our world with COVID for one thing, but, but it has been for many years with, with climate and, and other issues, that a spaciousness to be able to play with where the edges of those polarizing views are. Um, Yes. So, so one of the things I'm playing with in, in, in the UN is this idea of being curious. And it sounds childish a bit and, and, play, and, and a bit silly in the context of all of these intergovernmental agreements and all this stuff and billions of dollars and goodness. But actually, it's one of the most powerful intrinsic internal motivators for human beings to, to be where we've got to today, but also to where we might need to get to tomorrow. Being more curious can help stimulate the imagination. If we can imagine a different way of being in relationship with each other, which is not transactional. You know, I'm not here today, Jem, to bump up the likes on your channel. I'm not here today because you're paying me. I'm not, I'm just here today because I just love being in, in a space of open exchange where I don't know where it's going to go with other people. Um, being able to hold that in a space which is very transactional. So the UN system is still very transactional, not quite as much as the financial system, but actually it's an intermediary of the financial system to the perpetuation of sort of a systemic colonial world. Um, so it has those transactional characteristics. I'll do something mm -hmm. for you, you'll do something for me. When you're in a forest, when you're in a wild space, that sense disappears. There's no transactioning unless you've got a chainsaw in your hand and then, yeah, there's a transactional thing going on. But if you just walk into a forest, if you just sit in a wild space, there is so many relationships, so many things going on that there is an expanding that is possible mm -hmm. and a releasing of, I know this, I'm certain about this. Well, maybe I'm not as certain as I thought. I can bring that back in to those more certain spaces mm -hmm. to help people to play with that a little bit more. So we may, have, we, we may have questions because the way you're talking uh, to me is very resonant with, with a lot of the what people do in the deep adaptation field and the way and the way we talk um, about being okay with not knowing, um, uh, being really relishing curiosity and and surprises and uh, simply with the starting point of no longer believing that we can reform the current system to avoid catastrophe uh, and that it's going to be really bumpy and really difficult. But um, we want to stay positive creative uh, rather than just dig a bunker you know it's it's a so it's, it's trying to be more positive and creative in response to that as a view of the, the current situation in the future um there's a number of ways we could go now with the conversation um because also we talked about in terms of what could be the when we, we invited people to the conversation well, what could be the role of an intergovernmental system to help somehow cope with societal breakdown and collapse if, if there's such a possibility um, so I do want to ask you about that. But first, um, I want to just say for the people who are get, joining us on this call, um, please do send your questions for Scott to Stuart. So rather than put them in the chat box, send them directly to Stuart. It says Stuart questions to Stuart, please, if you see that there. Uh, and, then, and then we'll come to you. But before we do that, um, yeah, I just want to because we, we, we may, when we get questions from people, we may go the governance level, we may go um, interpersonal, uh, consciousness, all sorts, nature immersion. Let's see what, what, what people want to ask. But before we do that, 
Um, you still work with the UN system. You still struggle to produce reports like that that you showed us. Um, so I guess there is some faith in you or some hope in you or some certainty in you that the intergovernmental sector can do something to somehow slow or soften the breakdown of modern industrial societies or somehow plant something that might help after that collapse. Or there's another motivation in you. I'd like to hear about that. I, I think it's just as simple as, as being present in those spaces um, where a shift in perception could be the action that changes everything. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, showing up in a way where I am, where I am less certain, because I am less certain. Um, that report that I'm party, you know, I'm, I'm one of the contributing authors for next year, I wanted to write my chapter in poetry. Um, and you should have seen the looks on the editorial faces and the expert group as we can't, no, 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 no. It's an intergovernmental report. Can't they, they, must, they must really respect your work for, for, for you to still be in post after having suggested poetry. Yes. Yeah. That, and this is the strange thing that, you know, I think maybe less people in some of the conventional spaces respect me, but actually more people are are interested in this notion of, of being curious in a space where you're not really allowed to. This is the format. This is how it has to be. Can't we just do some pictures and stuff and some poetry? We've got to hold the complexity in a different way. And the prose is just flattening and, and, and it's a demented left, right linearity. And actually what I'm speaking to here doesn't work well in prose really at, at all. Um, so a couple of poems were put in to the to the, the chapter, but they've been excised and put onto the editorial cutting floor, not surprisingly. Um, do I have an ulterior motive? Um, no, I think ever since we started talking, Jim, um, the reason why we did start talking is because I'm very confident that the extinction of our species is 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 in any sort of meaningful way pretty pretty soon. Um, and we can walk towards that in a way which is increasingly violent and increasingly polarizing and increasingly destructive, which appears to be the way that certainly those in positions of power and influence are increasingly deciding to go. Um, or we can sort of take a little bit of a scribble out of the book of some of those so-called blue zone places um and regenerative and reverberative and generous communities and out of the uh knowledge uh, the oral knowledge and wisdom of indigenous communities and and maybe a bit more music and dance and play as ways to explore into complexity in a way which removes both the burden which many people feel of being an expert of being the one who knows knowing that they definitely don't know which maybe is at the heart of much of the, the a lot of the, the the mental health issues that many people in countries uh where you would say they have what they need to be able to exist are, are feeling this burden mm -hmm. so my ulterior motivation if it's anything is that we can just be more playful um and and enjoy being with each other more as we face increasingly grim uh breakdowns the atmospheric oceanic system has now broken down the arctic ocean melting at the rate it's melting it's destroying the physics of the northern hemisphere which impacts obviously on the, on the southern hemisphere the stability of seasonality is at risk now it's starting to break down that ends the food system at anywhere near the scale we're talking about little and transport systems energy systems and all of those fixed built systems that we have so when that happens do we start fighting each other do we go into grim as you said, bunkerization of everything, put the walls up, keep, try to keep people out? Or do we open our arms and say, my house is your house, my food is your food, my, 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 my song is your song, my story is your story? Do, do we? And, and I think 
any any chance any chance I can have, no matter what abuse that I suffer, and how many times I get told get out of the room, shut up, when I will keep trying to go back into those spaces, in, as well as playing in spaces where I'm feeling that love and that generosity and that curiosity. Partly that's in forests, partly that's in in warm conversations, like. DA holds, but but also but going back and forward and shuttling back and forward, getting drained and overwhelmed and heartbroken, going back and replenishing myself, going back in. Because every time that one person has a shift in perception, a whole world of possibilities opens that wasn't there previously. And that might be in those possibilities that we can step forward over these very difficult few years ahead. I, I just realize I'm feeling very greedy and I just want to keep talking to you. But I also know that we, we've got other questions. But just before we go to Rebecca for a question, there's two things that I really want to hear. I've never heard someone talk about reverberative, particularly after talking about regenerative. Um, could you just say something about that? But also, um, I think I'm hearing um, a call for and, and a commitment for, and a truth of kindness in, in that so governing collapse, any contribution from any person in the international system, that any system anywhere, is well, how can, I, how can I notice the way that I'm responding first and other people to increasing vulnerability and disaster and, and, and worrying um, news? How can I, how can I respond as kindly and curiously and playfully, that's something else you've said, as possible? Um, because I've also heard an, a sense of ultimate surrender in you that um, whether it, you're certain or you consider it very likely uh, that human is, extinction is on the horizon and, and not in a million years, um, much sooner than that. So um, any, uh, yeah, any comments? And then we'll go to Rebecca. I mean, human extinction in our sort of current configuration, I guess, um, you know, I, I certainly hold that I'm, I'm 14 billion odd years old. I'm just bunches of stardust mashed together in a different form, which allows me to be on this device in conversation with you, but I'm not going anywhere. I'll just be recomposed into some other form somewhere on this planet and maybe somewhere off this planet, who knows, but uh, it's just matter and energy. I just happen to have this beautiful chance to be able to be in a discussion in this way right now. I think that perspective helps as well. <laughs> that 100 years is actually not my, my, my life. It's just my current configuration. Um, in, in terms of the, the governing of collapse and, and the sense of surrender, that probably links to that. Um, it's both a surrender, but it's also a, an, an open arm welcoming of the end of an economic system, which is based on objective, objectification, exploitation, cruelty, domination and control. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy and hoping that we can accelerate out of that as fast as possible because there are other ways of being, which are more reverberative to that word, which is a word that um, I think Ian McGilchrist maybe was one of the first who wrote about that in um, The Master and His Emissary, but I think it probably goes back a long way before that. This notion of a multi-directional, the way our brain works, the way, um, the way indigenous cultures actually held their relationships with all life, reverber it's both generous, but it's also reciprocal. So there's a reciprocity and a generosity going on simultaneously um because everything is obviously in relationship with everything simultaneously at all times i'm i'm playing with this idea within that that idea of trying to bring people into possibly a different uh way of perceiving their world and maybe having uh more recognition of the constraints from the context which they've grown up in and existed in their cultural their linguistic their family their educational which have actually reduced the choices that they can make and actually holding at that level, it eliminates the possibility of judging a person for making bad decisions. You know, someone like a Boris Johnson, some would say he makes a lot of bad decisions. But actually, if you think about the context in which he has got to his 50 odd years old, how could it be almost any other without having people within his space saying, hang on, buddy, hang on. That's not a kind and caring way to be being constantly reinforced that that's a great way to be up and onwards, buddy. So actually just making the choice to be kind and care caring whenever you can in any space, regardless, and knowing that there will be a reciprocity there, 
not looking for it, not seeking it, and certainly not seeking any attribution of change in a system. I'm not trying to change anything, but I know that if you are in, as a forest is, a constantly generously flowing resources, the resources and the currency of a forest is the water, it's the, it's the exchanges of nutrients between fungal and fungi and lichen and the roots of trees and the leaves and the birds and, the, and everything. Those currencies are so much more important than artificial currencies, which actually work to destroy those currencies. So I'm playing with this idea of, uh, and it's, it's a long term, but uh, hip for short, um, heterophenomenological, intergenerational, polycultural and playful governance. Heterophenomenological, intergenerational, playful, polycultural governance. So it has to be playful, cool. It has to be intergenerational. We've got to be able to bring the wisdom of elders together with the, the freedom and the immediacy and wonder of, the young, of younger people. But we've also got to do that in a way which is not autophenomenological, i.e. maintaining that narrative story, which is always wrong. My story is wrong because I will continue to self-correct and defend my ego until I die. And so will the Saudi Arabian government. So will you know the French Ministry of Health? So will whoever. I, I like the that. I like what you've mapped out there, and I'm just wondering how you convey that in the playful way. Maybe write a heavy metal rock song and play it at the next UNDRR summit. Maybe that will be the way to go. Um, I put a beat poem together at the end of last year and circulated okay. that around, and some people were like, "That's cool." Yes, I'm going to go to Rebecca now. Let's let's go to Rebecca now. Your question, please, for for Scott. Also, say you know where you, where you're from and stuff. Thanks. Hi there. Thanks for organising this. My name's Rebecca Gibbs, and um, I've worked a lot strategically on climate change, but I now work practically, and I help convene the Cavents Roundtable. Um, I'd like to ask about what I would call the interstitial space. And by that, I mean the space between mutual aid and large strategic organizations. It seems to me, and in some ways you're referring to this, Scott, that this is the space where quite a lot is gonna to need to happen because the strategic organizations are not up to it or not sufficiently aware. But my experience of mutual aid has been that it also won't be able to hold uh, the whole enormity of what we are facing. And so I'm interested in that because there's, there's not a massive amount of awareness in that space <laughs> or resources um, or preparedness. And so I'm kind of thoughtful about whether you agree that that space is where things need to happen and whether you have thoughts about what we do about it. Thank you. Oh, I love it, Rebecca. Yes. Um, yeah. So, I, I do think, and I, and I do try to tell or offer to people um, in, in the UN intergovernmental spaces to just read, you know, some of Kropotkin's essays from the 1890s. Some of you may know the work of Peter Kropotkin, but he basically uh, wrote a series of wonderful essays refuting this sort of industrial competitive mindset interpretation of Darwin's theory of evolution um, and said, no, it's... It, it, that's not how. That's not what he was saying, and that's not how evolution uh, happens. That's not how the adaptation of life happens in the context of the environments in which it, it's in. He wrote beautifully about the importance of mutual aid, and I think, unfortunately, the the sort of the separation narrative, the industrial, the competitive mindset narrative, which has then fed into, and I would argue, corrupted the UN system which is so far away from the initial writings of the UN Charter of, of the mid 1940s, that that notion of mutual aid is completely dwarfed by, by the perpetuation of systemic racism, systemic colonialism, white savior expert dominant mindset. Um, that, that community groups on the ground, the practical implementers on the ground um, are, are actually necessarily involved in that messy relationing of all of the different parts of life, the banging together of cultures, of different communities, of different ways of knowing, which that separation up at that strategic level, and I, I talk about the insulation from consequences, just the continuation of being able to do things, 
and say, but it's not working, it's getting worse, but we keep doing the right thing. But, but maybe you're not, but no, we are, because we've always done it this way, so it's definitely the right way. We're the clever ones, we're helping them. Even the rhetoric of developed countries and developing countries, how insane that that is still being spoken about. At the very least, let's call them recovering countries from the decimation of what happened in those places. But actually, we're all just human beings with different pigmentation because of where our ancestors happened to live. And so that interstitial or the, the, even I mean, the liminal space that does, it, it very much exists. And it is where I am playing in this notion I have of sort of intergenerational and polycultural and playful ways of being, I think is a way that I'm currently trying to think about how maybe knitting some of that together. I don't know if that helps at all. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, uh, yeah, we, um, Kevin's asked me to uh, uh, ask his question for him. So I'll just do that now. Um, where are we? Here we go. So Kevin asks, uh, Kevin Guyan, who's from Canada and where it's 4 a.m. or something, <laughs> how can, can transitional governance concepts be introduced into the UN system? Things like uh, pre-colonial democratic processes, so indigenous consensus uh, systems or Greek era citizens assemblies, and a word I haven't heard before, neighborocracy. So how can such things be introduced to the UN system um, to help with adaptation to the difficult era we're, we're entering? Or have yeah, they been tried? Neighborocracy instead of chumocracy would be that'd be a nice start. There's a bit too much chumocracy going on in certain places in the world. Um, it, that that is what I and and others um, are, are trying to do um, to connect to connect at the the two levels which I believe are the only two levels that sort of matter um, for life on this planet. One is at, at, at as I think as Rebecca was saying at the individual and the community and the in place, that actually, that's reality. From your microbiome to you as an individual to the place that you live, eat, exist, sleep. And then the only other level that matters is the planetary system level, because that is that is a, a, a defined living system boundary, arguably in constant interaction with the rest of the universe, but that level does make some sense. Everything in between is nonsense. And, you know, I've got this sort of metaphorical eraser, which I just like to play with that rub all those stupid lines off our beautiful world um, that were created only over the last few hundred years. And most of them only in the last sort of 50 or 60 years. Um, if we can actually conceptualize at a planetary level, we're all actually in this together in an interdependent way, but we all actually are also in place. And we're very much reliant on and in relationship with being able to have governance at, at really just those two levels. And yes, tapping into indigenous ways of being in relationship in an extended sort of family way, your human interactions, but also your brotherly and sisterly and cousin relationships with the rivers and the mountains and the soil and the birds and the, and the turtles and, and the dolphins and the orcas and whatever. Um, but also being able to have that zoom in, zoom out to, because of, and as you started, I think, um, Jim, talking about our ability to apply scientific understanding, scientific method, to be able to understand those system processes, which are way beyond that lived specific reality that each of us has with all of our specific particular complexities and relationships. But honoring both simultaneously and I think it was, uh, it was Daniel Christian Baal, I think he first came up with the idea of panicky, this sort of panicist logic that, that looping connections between and interdependencies all the way from your microbiome and the subatomic up to the, the global system and the universe. Everything's always connected. And it's just the speed and the magnitude of the flows between that sort of determine the stability of the environmental context in which you exist. Um, if you mess with those environmental contexts, they obviously will mess with you because it's always interrelated. And much of that wisdom, that pre-Plato pre wisdom, pre-Greek citizens assemblies actually back into the Heraclites and before 
which was really just an understanding of what indigenous wisdom and, in, and, and indigenous communities knew before the sort of domestication of our species by wheat 10, 12,000 years ago. Um, that notion that there, that there is a place that you're in, that you're in, if you are noticing and able to attend to that, then there is greater possibility of you being able to maintain a relationship, a nourishing relationship, both for yourself and for your environment. If you break that, you break you you heighten the chances of that human extinction possibility that we're possibly facing. I'm I'm, I'm going to uh, skip to you, Ray. Ray's got a question. Ray from Olford works in in uh, well, you, you you've you've said in the chat that you work in the uh, more practical, pragmatic side. Um, of yes, this but, topic, but I, I've, and you've got a question I, about Bali and 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 the agenda sure, of the UNDR. Sure. But I have, I have, in my defence, I have lived in Fintorn for several years and and done my NBC and and workshops with Joanna Macy, so I can do the emotional stuff too. Um, and maybe I, I had a job there. Yeah, long, lots of stories. Um, yeah, so I've had really good experiences with UNDRR, really open to to um, to extinction type thinking, at least in private. But also Molly Jan and NASA, um, you know, coming through in Geneva. So uh, and the, the the drama groups they had in there. So I mean, it's a bit fluffy. We're not sort of the hard edge, but but some really good thinking as well. So um, uh, do you like those those um, those gatherings, either the global one or the the continental ones? Uh, will you be in Bali? And shall we do something there? Because like looking at the people in this call and, and some of the faces, it seems like, hey, we could we, we, we can't just complain and not do something. Let's do something. Um, I think we might have met somewhere, actually, Ray. Well, I as soon as so. I saw your name and yeah, I mean, I work closely with Molly um, and, and the NASA group for NASA team and, and the Knowledge Systems for Sustainability. Um, yes. We're setting that graph, up. And the graph cube and the three dimensionality. That, I, I, I created the graph cube. Yeah. So if you like that, then. Yeah, um, I loved it. It's great. That, I do um, recommend. I even made a yeah, URL yeah. so that people could find it easily. I think oh, it's good. Thank you. Graphcube.info, yeah. but it might have expired now. Oh, maybe some, super I'll try and put the link in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, yes, those gatherings uh, are, are, are lovely in some ways because of that human to human connection uh, mm. certainly that used to be possible i've been at you know all of them since whatever 2012 or something 2013 um back in geneva as it was um i won't be going to bali um but i am i am uh, contributing to many of the things that are happening and going to be happening in bali uh, in particular one of the areas that uh, i'm interested in and i'm i'm contributing a lot to at the moment is on what's called the midterm review which you're probably familiar with so these 2015 to 2013 yeah. agendas oh, in yeah. the midterm review, they basically go, oh, how do we do? And do we need to course correct? Do we need to do things differently? And the answer is obviously, <laughs> hell yeah. You <laughs> haven't done much at all in the first seven years. So yes. So there's this process of you know, consultations. But what I'm helping with is exactly what we've been talking about. Can we create different spaces? Where we can bring yes the molly jans of the world and yes the you know ministerial level of the world and yes the investors of the world but actually can we bring them together with children and indigenous communities and local populations and can we make it um a sort of what did i describe it the other day liminal cubism so you know picasso was was magical in the way that he basically said we don't only have to have the three-point perspective he said we can have all perspectives as long as they're white male we can have all the perspectives in the world as long as they're white males. Like, great, great. But what does liminal yeah. mean? Liminal, it's the space in between. It's the dawn and the dusk of a day where you're not in night, you're not in day. You're not in knowing and you're not in complete unknowing to, to um, Jem's earlier point. You have some certainties and you have some uncertainties and you're able to play in the confusion of that space. And it's not denying the importance of reductionist approaches and the scientific method. All it's saying is, what are they in service of and what are they hiding? And what are the metaphors which underpin why they are being modelled and why that science is choosing those questions? When there is an infinite number of other questions which are maybe much more difficult to answer because they don't have answers. Like, what is health? What is success? What is risk even? These are questions that can be played into and I think if we can have more conversations in those more formal structural spaces 
that you're talking about, where we are asking questions which cannot be answered but can be explored, we actually may be able to shift some of the ways that we're addressing these challenges and some of the ways we're even just perceiving the reality in which we're able to think about those challenges. So, yeah, so, um, um, super cool. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. I want to go for our last question. We've just got a few minutes because we started a few minutes late. Um, to uh, Jai, I, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Jaiwook. Uh, the question is, do you actually think the uh, organized, sorry if there's noise from my cat here, if there's, um, if we're not going to see the kinds of changes you think that will be significant from the kind of institutions that exist in, in international governance and national governance at the moment, then don't we just need revolutionary change and therefore should we be working on revolution? Well, yes and no. Um, I think I am working on revolution and evolution and whichever way you want to describe it. I. I do, I do honestly believe in the possibilities of a shift in perception, shifting all possibilities. And, you know, th th there are lots of examples that I've had over the last few years as I've been approaching spaces to try to enable the possibility for people to have a shift in perception. Um, what, what, do I, what do I really mean by that? You know, as I described before, my perception of the world um, 10 years ago was a perception which had been sort of gifted to me and actually inculcated into me that, that nature is a machine, fixing and solving can be done. And actually, if you're very clever and you know all the right things, then you are the one who can fix and solve. And all you've got to do is then bring people and money together and then everything will be fine. That, that shift in perception may take time, but it can actually be a, a, a shift in, in a second in a minute, in a single conversation, if there is the tonality for the possibility of that shift to happen. And some of the work that I, I do on uh, what are called warm data conversations with, with Nora Bateson, on being able to help people to come into conversations which are have multiple contexts and those sort of questions I was saying to Ray, to allow for that exploration and basically the reconfiguration and the, and the, and the, the re-patterning uh, um, of your relationship to your memories of who you are and what you know to be able to be in a different relationship with the reality that you're observing and existing in. And that shift in perception is revolutionary. You know, Gregory Bateson, Nora's dad, spoke about that, that that shift in perception will alter your universe, your understanding of everything can shift and it is a scary moment and therefore it should never be done alone if you can avoid it. It often happens in trauma where you have a traumatic experience, maybe you're diagnosed with stage four cancer. Okay, bugger my diary, I couldn't care less about my diary, I'm just gonna get on with living. Often it can be in that single moment, a single conversation, maybe you're made redundant. Maybe you get accepted to publish in a journal or some, some, some moment that can actually shift your perception of both yourself and the world. I'm trying to have this space to have as many possibilities of people being able to shift their perception as many times as possible with the belief and the understanding and the learning from um, indigenous and relational practices that, that in that moment, there is a new possibility of us being kinder, more caring and more in relationship. And if you feel you're in relationship with other people as opposed to transacting with them, there's much less chance that you're going to be willing to be cruel to them, that you're willing to exploit them, that you're willing to dehumanize them because you, you feel that they are part of you because they are, or you feel that the river is part of you or the grasses. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. yeah. What I'm hearing is that a different way of being to the one that we've been schooled in, which doesn't have all these separations and othering and alienation, is in itself revolutionary and we can be that revolution right now in the way that we are in whatever work we do um, and it might add up uh, to something uh, but it's also just really good in itself um, and it might not and yeah. it's actually that liminal that sort of holding of that liminal space is mm -hmm. i don't know if any of this is going to make any a lick of difference but actually i at the same time i do know it's going to make a difference because i've 
felt that shift in other people and the way I'm in relationship with them. And if they continue doing what they're doing, but with that, that revolutionary shift in the way that they're, the way that they're being, not what they're doing necessarily, but the way that they're being present as they're doing it, then that next person and that next person, and just like a COVID infection, can spread through the population. And the law of, of big numbers, exponential growth, one or two people can actually make a phenomenal difference. And if only one or two people on this call are, are go away thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I can be different to how I was, super cool. And if none do, okay, maybe in a week or two weeks or a month or six months, something will shift because of the space and the place we've been in together in relationship. Yeah, so thank you for your time together and thank you for scotting with us. <laughs> this is uh, fascinating to see. I've never seen anyone put uh, talk about themselves. So I've been enjoying gemming with, with, with you uh, today. And uh, so thanks to everyone who's joined us from around the world, members of the Deep Adaptation Forum and other guests. And um, Can I just I'm end with gonna... a little poem? Is that okay? I'm, I'd love to end Sure, with sure. Poem. I was just saying, I'm not going to read. I was just about to say, I'm not going to read the next report that you write if it looks like the one you just showed us. But um, if you could summarize it in a song or a poem, poem yes. then I'm up for it. So you've, you've got a poem, have you? I do. All right then. Okay, so we're just going to hear the poem and then end the meeting. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. It's called, it's called A Little Duck by uh, a gentleman called uh, Michael Lunig. A little duck. With a bit of luck, a duck will come into your life. When you are at the peak of your great powers and your achievement towers like a smoking chimney stack, it will be a quack. And right there at your feet, a little duck will stand. She will take you by the hand and lead you. Like a child with no defence, she will lead you into wisdom, joy and innocence. That little duck, I wish you luck. And I do wish all of you good health and lots of play. <laughs>